on today's episode of the Law of Tech podcast. There are also institutions that are basically pushing the responsibility to students or to people that are deaf or to even their employees, which are lecturers, uh, to make the content accessible themselves. And I would really say to those organizations that I think it's uh, more wise to build a solution that the organization provides accessible content or ex an accessible way of creating content and not push even more responsibilities on, on teachers. Just get started with it and, and, and just try it with one faculty and see what happens. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Law of Tech podcast. In this episode, we'll be delving deeper into a highly relevant and much discussed topic, namely the move towards digital accessibility and education. And I'm really excited for this episode um, because we'll be exploring this topic from a somewhat different angle. Uh, and for this, I am joined by Rafi Leon. Rafi is responsible for business development at Ambuscript, a young tech startup based in Amsterdam and Berlin, which builds software that enables users to automatically transcribe audio into text using speech recognition. At least that is, I think, the or was at least the original focus. Uh, but we'll get into this a little later. Um, and in that position, he advises organizations on how to use speech recognition AI in order to make video content accessible and inclusive with a special focus on education in the Netherlands. Rafi, welcome to the show and thanks for making the time to join me. Thank you. Thank you for the great intro. Now, before we really get into, uh, I guess, the juicy part of this uh, this topic, um, I'm interested to know, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got into this field and especially also into the domain of digital accessibility in education? Yeah, of course. So I uh, joined Emberscript uh, two years ago because uh, I was uh, an entrepreneur myself and uh, was really frustrated with how intransparent uh, the transcription world in Europe was. And uh, I wanted to solve that, uh, that problem. And uh, so I joined Emberscript because uh, we were busy uh, doing that. And uh, uh, as you said, that was the fo main focus uh, two years ago, making transcription uh, more easy and more uh, transparent. And that was, that was a lot of fun. But now we see, uh, as we'll deep dive a little bit later, um, the digital accessibility case uh, starting to get more attention and more awareness. Uh, although we were always uh, aware of the topic, now uh, we really see uh, some uh, um, some movement in, in the market and, and moving on the legislation part as well. And that's why the main focus is now within education and within uh, accessibility and our, our mission really is to make all audio accessible, uh, all, all audio and video accessible. Now, before we um, delve a little deeper into, you know, the topic of education and digital accessibility, uh, I think it's good to take a look at the broader context first. So how should we understand this concept of digital accessibility in general and what is going on in the European Union or has been going on with regard to this topic? Yeah, yeah, very, very, very good question to uh, to start off with. I think so. Let's say let's make it uh, very practical. So when you go, uh, for example, to a hospital or any other public environment, uh, there are all these kinds of things uh, in place to help people with a disability. For example, elevators, right? But also um, uh, things where you're able to go uh, with the wheelchair more easily uh, or uh, in in the elevator that it's uh, in in the language for the for people that are blind right that the, the, the buttons you're able to press so these all these things are in place now for a longer period of time and uh, we see that as normal right everybody sees that as normal and that's normal that's in place well in the digital world this is completely not in place yet and there are guidelines for it uh, uh, how to make actually something accessible on the digital world. But that's the 
main issue, right? The whole digital world exploded and um, it's actually totally not accessible for people that are blind, people with de- uh, that are deaf or have hearing impairments or uh, people with, with other kinds of disabilities. And that's that's the main concept. Okay, and the European Union obviously also saw the need to focus on this topic. Uh, They uh, thought of a number of ways to realize this digital accessibility. What has the European Union envisioned with regard to this area of focus? Yeah, exactly. So in 2016, uh, it really uh, picked up some steam in uh, the, within the European Union. Uh, so it was an entry into force of a directive to put this on the agenda. And then um, it has been uh, translated into local legislation uh, in 2018 that there should be legislation for access- digital accessibility. And in September 2020, there was a deadline that all content should be published in an accessible way. So that's the reality that we're living today. And what's coming up in the future is that there's also uh, the European Accessibility Act, which in 2022, it will already be uh, translated to member states. And in 2025, it will be mandatory uh, to be fully accessible. And what that entails, um, we can deep dive to uh, as well. Yeah. Exactly. Now, interestingly, uh, these acts and these re- regulations, they don't really only uh, create benefits for, for example, people with uh, disabilities, but they also create obligations, like we just said, uh, for, for other organizations, for other people, uh, including, for example, educational institutions. Um, now, I don't know to what extent these regulations apply to educational institutions specifically. I know that in within the European Union, or at least in their strategy that they outlined, they had a focus on different areas among which educational institutions. Are these specifically addressed in these legal frameworks? So what's hard about the, the, the framework as, lo- as how I understand it is um, that there basically are directives and... and Regulations. Exactly. And, and uh, then they re- refer within those two different norms so, so that's that's um, uh, the f- the framework. And for educational institutions, the thing is, in all these member states, they can of course adapt it a little bit, but most of them uh, focus on the public sector and government. And in some countries, the educational system is completely government, and in other countries, it's semi-government, and again, other countries, it's private. So that makes it uh, tricky to generalize. But what I do think is that it's maybe one of the most important sectors to make accessible. So how visually accessible is education even at the moment? Um, Good question. Again, also within education, maybe also because of Corona, but also before before that, um, there has been this video explosion uh, taken off, right? And um, which means that there are all new structures and new tools that people are using, uh, which basically, especially within the pandemic, uh, caused a lot of panic. And how can we do this? How can we go remote? But now they're get, we're getting to a stage that people are professionalizing, uh, organizations are, are, are trying to optimize it, and then they're also thinking about accessibility. So what, uh, what I really see is when, when you're at an optimizing stage, then accessibility comes in, and when not, not at the stage when you're trying to set something up, right? Also because it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, within the whole European Union, this the Digital Accessibility Act uh, is estimated to touch around 50 million people. So that's a lot. But I actually don't want to have that discussion, how many people. Um, because I think we have to take one step back again, which is we want to make it inclusive society and uh, equal um, chances of opportunity right so it shouldn't matter if it's only two people or or, or 10 people or 5000 people or 5 million people right and uh, of course it's a very idealistic uh, way of looking at it but i think all universities actually have this attitude uh, or at least uh, the majority of them uh, and have this mindset so i think uh, we should not try to marginalize it and next to that making stuff accessible, making your content accessible uh, is actually also has so many advantages also with for people that that 
don't have a disability. So I also think we should just m look at more uh, at that level and just say, okay, this is kind of guideline we should just see as normal, just as the elevator in the hospital, instead of trying to marginalize it to a certain group and then say, oh, but we don't have to invest so much money in it or whatever conclusions you, uh, you put on it. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, this all points into the direction that regardless of whether it is for disabled people or for anyone in the educational system, change is necessary. Now, I think you already touched upon uh, a couple of things that need change just before. Now, I'm interested to know, looking at it from your perspective, how do you see um, this legislation? How easy is it to comply um, so, um, in the last two years, I've seen a lot of, uh, and I'm going to focus here on the, on the Dutch market because I know it the best. I've seen a lot of, uh, non-profits, consultants and, uh, for-profit companies rise within or, or be founded within this uh, topic, um, to basically give, give advice, give implementation advice and, and a lot of projects, um, going to those kind of companies that just give advice, right? Which means it's a lot of work, right? If, if so many companies can give you a consultancy adv advice on digital ex becoming digital accessible, I think it's a sign that it's a lot of work. You need a lot of people on it. So um, it's, not, it's definitely not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. And um, for example, what you can do is if you don't, do not comply yet, you just need to be transparent with it. So within the Dutch law, it's the case that you need to show that you're taking steps, right? And then uh, have somewhere a disclaimer in your, in your website or somewhere transparent that these and these steps we took this year and these and these we will. But uh, that's also something that a lot of organizations uh, use to, you know, put it to next year and uh, and spread the work so to say yeah exactly now uh i'd like to move to amber script um so amber script really uses technology to help in making education more digitally accessible can you tell us a little bit more about what exactly amber script does in this context and also uh what the technology is that it uses to do that yeah, so the mission of Emberscript is to make all audio and video accessible with the vision that in 2026, all video in all industries is subtitled in the same language, right? So not translations, I'm not talking about translations yet. <laughs> that's very ambitious, but that's our vision that in 2026, all video, which is exploding and the video markets keeps growing, will be subtitled. And that's a realization you have to you have to first adapt, right? Because not all video is subtitled now. Um, and then what we see is if you just accept the concept that very soon all video is subtitled, that it's impossible to see everybody doing that in a very manual process with uh, thousands and thousands of subtitlers doing that. So you need AI, right? You need technology uh, to make that possible. Uh, still, it will be as a tool, uh, we believe, uh, if you're taking the whole accessibility back to it, then uh, to make a video accessible uh, and you want to do that with subtitling, then AI is not enough, but it's a way to make it more easy. It's a way to make it more affordable. It's a way to make it faster. And with the video explosion, you need it. So we are building speech recognition uh, models in all European languages. That's our vision. Uh, and then in combination with a network of professional uh, subtitlers uh, and transcriptionists who are able to, if needed, perfect it. Um, that's really interesting, actually. Now, when you look at the work that you're doing, um, have you got any practical examples of institutions that have joined you uh, and made use of Amber Scripts in making their education more digitally accessible? So to ma make it more practical, we want to make our technology, but also the platform, if you would like to use our network of captioners, and very, very approachable. Because if you want to make a lot of subtitles, we feel like at some point it's a commodity, right? So um, that's why we integrate with uh, a lot of already existing systems 
in uh, education, but also outside of education. So for example, Cultura, a big video management system, is uh, we are partner with them, which means that we are just able to be integrated in the workflow very, very seamlessly. And there are organizations that use that. Um, and, but for example, Wageningen University, they uh, they use us as a way to make their uh, video accessible and uh, they use uh, presentations to go which is a similar video management system like Cultura and we are actually the only player that is able to deliver uh, such services as we do that is integrated in 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 presentations to go in the tool uh, so uh, that's why they chose us but there are front runners and uh, all the other institutions we yeah we tr- we want to engage with are there any other companies out there that are doing something similar or are you, are you really unique in the netherlands or in europe or in general in doing this yeah uh, definitely so this is a nice bridge thank you so much <laughs> So uh, sure yeah, <laughs> to to America, so uh, to the states. So in the United States, you have a lot. You have a lot of players, uh, to be honest, who uh, do the same uh, same thing. Think of uh, Three Play Media or Verbit, even uh, who's actually based in in Israel, but uh, focuses uh, most of their efforts into the United States market. And uh, the the reason why there are so many players there is because in the US, they're actually much further ahead on the legislation. And as you might know, in the US, they're also much more aggressive in lawsuits. So um, I have some examples prepared. For example, in 2013, there was a lawsuit against Netflix. And since then, they actually declared that they will caption all their movies, right? Also in the same language. And uh, this, this is 2013. And in I think 2015, uh, there was a, a lawsuit against MIT from Harvard and, and Harvard. Uh, and it's a lawsuit over the lack of accurate, comprehensive video captioning in public facing free on- online courses. And since then, the market in the US has, has exploded um, because of the legislation and because of these lawsuits, they are massively adopting uh, manual captions, what we just talked about, which is very expensive, right? And, and very time consuming and, and a big investment. Um, that's what they're doing in the US. But in Europe, they're not actually, uh, we were quite unique, I believe. That's why we feel it's also very important to stress that we are a European player, right? With European norms of handling privacy issues, but also with a European team who are able to understand European languages and the complexity of them and the dialects that we have in a very small continent compared to the US. And our team, for example, exists of 18 nationalities all across Europe. You said like in the US, they don't really focus too much, or I can't really generalize here either, but too much on AI, whereas, for example, Amberscript really focuses on AI. But the thing with AI, um, there are a number of concerns, especially when it comes down to some of the implications artificial intelligence may have. There may be biases, for example, and you also have data protection issues with data that is being collected. Do you come across any of these issues um, when using the AI with AmberScript? Very good question. And I'll... I'll get to it, but quickly about the US. I think they also, these companies also use AI as a tool, right? But in the US, there's just so much more willingness to invest in the manual part that they don't say, uh, let's, yes, let's use it as a baseline and then uh, improve it for only the important things. They just make everything accessible, otherwise they get sued. And in Europe, it's a different story, right? So uh, that a little bit about, about, about the US and the use of AI. So I do think they use it to make it more affordable. But uh, uh, about the, about indeed the, 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 the negative also aspects of using AI or challenges that come with it, maybe a better word. Um, so first of all, I think very important topic always when using AI is, are there getting people out of work because of it, right? Are we replacing jobs with it? And, and I think on that part, I think the way that Emberscript uses AI and other companies within this field, it's actually creating jobs and not replacing jobs. And I'll explain. So um, with so much more video and, and 
video exploding, as we said, it's necessary to use AI and these captions are not being made at the moment, right? So it's not that we're optimizing a process. No, we're creating some, some process that actually in, enables us humans to make captions on these videos. Because even if you would have the money, if you want to continue to uh, use caption all videos, let's say in 2030, when, when, when we have millions and millions and millions of, of, of video every day pumping into the internet on social media on everything, if you don't use technology, the whole world is subtitling. So that's not an option. So uh, I think that we're actually creating jobs, right? Because uh, we enable a whole new market with, with the use of AI. And then I think the, the privacy part is also very, very important. And that's why we believe there is such a need for a European player. Because uh, also on legal grounds, you, you don't want to send your data outside of the EU. Um, so I think it's very important that there is a European player that's able to do this. And I would actually welcome more players <laughs> uh, that, that, that want to help on this, on this issue. Uh, because I think it's not wise to use American companies, uh, especially within education uh, or, or Chinese companies or any other company that's outside of EU. So that's why I think uh, it's also very important. Now, one thing that also comes to mind with me uh, here, well, this whole topic of bias in AI, does this even apply to the AI that you're using? Because they could lead to discrimination and thereby, in, in the end, also like exclusion instead of like inclusion in education. Yeah, I think you're scratching the surface of a very important uh, dilemma within AI in general, not only at Emberscript. Um, so, of course, you want to make... AI as, as fast as possible and, and you want to generate models, right? And uh, you want to use data for it, but then actually you should have the patience to also uh, make sure that it's actually inclusive data, right? That's actually, I think, your point, that you're not using data which is uh, therefore making the model biased to a certain group of people. I think it's a dilemma. And I, I think you should be very careful which data you use and how you make your models. But I, I do think it's a more general thought uh, and, and not something you can solve tomorrow, um, but something that you just should keep in mind when optimizing and making new models. So we have speech scientists in-house, right, that, 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 are, that are aware of this and that, uh, that in future models, we are aware of this. Yeah, so I think it's a very very important point that you're making and more companies that are uh, within AI should uh, should really focus on this and not yeah, make sure that we're not that, that we're by trying to do something which is inclusive making it exclusive that should not that should not happen yeah there are a lot of discussions on this topic at the moment when that's like a really sensitive area of, of course great that you're working on this I think really an example uh, to other companies as well in that sense um, then looking towards the future, and I think that that might also be a good place to wrap up the episode um, on, on a positive note following what you just said. Where do you see the activities of Amber Script heading in the near future specifically? As this is the also tech podcast, let's talk about the cutting edge stuff that we're working on. So that's, that's cool. So I'm not promising any of the customers that, that this is here tomorrow, just as a disclaimer, so uh, the cutting edge stuff that we're working on is, let's say, uh, live subtitling, live transcription. There are some companies that already have it, but here comes the complexity of the European languages again. So most of those live solutions are actually in English or in Chinese, for example, but uh, not so much in, in Europe's languages. So uh, that's what we're working on. Something else that we're working on is actually a partnership with uh, another company that, that we're able to connect a iPhone app or an Android app, just an app on your phone, to a device and the device another company uh, will, will make and that the device is able to go as a clip on to uh, somebody who is going to speak and then the app will show to the deaf person the, the text. So basically the, the, the deaf person will uh, carry this mic and give it to, to his teacher or uh, any 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 person he wants to talk to, and then he just uses the app to read what the, this person is saying. I think that's super cool. Um, 
and and a, and a third thing in the far future is that uh, yeah, it's also the field of translation, which is super tricky, uh, because as you can imagine, if you have a, a margin of error from uh, the source language, let's say you use AI and speech recognition to get from, let's say, uh, the audio to a 80% correct text, then if you want to translate that, then there's again a margin of error, which makes the translated one hard to use. So in the far future, we would also uh, look into into translation and how we can uh, make that uh, work. So those three things on technology, and, and I don't want to offend you on the law part. Let's talk <laughs> about law, definitely. <laughs> so I think uh, 2025, that's that's uh, in, the, in the midterm future, right? Um, that's the European Accessibility Act, let's stress it again, which makes it mandatory for all companies except micro enterprises in the whole of European Union to make the internet an accessible place, right? And so it's not only for government, it's for all companies. So that's very, very important for, for our company, but I think for society that uh, we make the internet an accessible place, just like the hospital we talked about uh, in at the start. And I think that a lot of interesting things will show up along that way, even though it's not that long from now. Um, and if you could give one piece of advice to educational institutions, what piece of advice would you give to them or what would you tell them to take this topic more seriously? I think it's important that you make it a priority that you start doing this, right? Because it also saves you a lot of work when inevitably you have to do it. Uh, that's the, just a quick tip. But the more deeper advice is that there are also institutions that are basically pushing the responsibility to students or to people that are deaf or to even their employees, which are lecturers, right? Uh, to make the content accessible themselves. And I would really say to those organizations that I think it's uh, more wise to build a solution that the organization provides accessible content or ex an accessible way of creating content, maybe better, a platform which is easy to use so you can make your content accessible and not push even more responsibilities on, on teachers. Just get started with it and, and, and just try it with one faculty and see what happens. Yep. No, great advice. And I agree with you. I think it's also more efficient if you uh, look at this topic from an organizational uh, perspective and on an individual level. I've learned a lot from this. So thank you very much uh, for t talking a little bit more about this, uh, this topic and also from the perspective of actually a tech company working in this. So it was great having you here and uh, talking about this. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity. And uh, I think the podcast that you're making is super cool and very interesting. So keep, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> thank you very much. You also keep up the good work. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Law of Tech podcast. If you want to make sure you keep up to date with the show and never miss out on an episode, be sure to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice and follow the Law of Tech on social media. If you enjoyed the show, please give it a rating or review as it helps others discover the show. And don't forget to share it with your network. For now, have a great day and I'll see you in the next episode of the Law of Tech podcast. Oh, my God.